Start, I'm going to start real quick with a, um, a short video, just a couple minutes long, but it's my 2020, um, kind of my favorite photos of, of 2020. So it, it's an interesting look because of the, of the year of the pandemic. So I kept the photos in chronological order, even though I didn't take nearly as many photos last year as I have in the past. Um, but I just think the, the roller coaster ride that it takes is kind of a neat, a neat right. view. Have to share your screen and I do that with... Thank you. 
right, well, let me get to the, uh, let's see what I got going here. All right, so we're still sharing, everybody's good. All right, well, yeah, that was uh, 2020 for me. I, I don't know about you guys, um, I have a very hard time picking my favorite photos out of what I shoot. Um, that took me half a day to come up with those. Um, I just seem to like them all for whatever reason. And, you know, they're very personal to you. And there's things that are about a photo that I may love that, well, but it's not, it's not, you know, a newsworthy photo or it's not gonna be an award-winning photo, but when I know the story behind it, it becomes a really cool photo to me. So um, that's what, what strikes me when, when I'm going through these photos and it's always very hard to, to pick a few. Um, so I'm with, a, I work for USA Today and I work for the Advertiser in Lafayette. Uh, I only started photography about five years ago. Um, I, my background has been in corporate marketing and advertising and I traveled the country quite a bit uh, back then and I had opportunity to visit every state in the U.S. and I went to every city. Every other week I was flying somewhere on business and I always had a very loose travel schedule so I carried a backpack with my camera. I walked the cities and I was just doing photojournalism for fun. I didn't even know what it was or that I was even trying to do that. It just was what was natural to me. Um, I never took a class, I never read a book, I never watched a YouTube video. I literally played with my camera and got it wrong until I got it right. I actually had started doing um, a lot with my iPhone while I was traveling, because if I didn't carry a camera, I always had a phone with me, and I was doing what I called iPhone art. I would take a photo with my iPhone, and when I was sitting in airports or in, in you know, restaurants, I would play with the photos, and I would edit them and kind of create my little my own art. It was just what I did for fun because at the time, being in advertising, everything I did was for clients. And I was dictated to by what my client would pay for and would buy. And so when I got to do my own photos, it was, a, it was an opportunity for me to do what I wanted with nobody's permission. I didn't care if anybody liked it. It was just stuff that I did for fun. And uh, that's the way I got, got started doing things. Um, so I ended up uh, actually just asking to be a freelancer for a newspaper. And um, from there, it just, it just snowballed. For the next three, four months, I did about 100 assignments. And everything I did just seemed to work out. And by the end of that, that four month period, I, um, I just asked to do more freelance work. And they said, why don't you just take the job as a staff photographer for the advertiser? And I didn't think I was qualified. And I told them, I said, look, if you wanna hire me, it's on you. And if you don't like what I do, then I'm not trying to sell you my, on myself because, you know, in, in, from a marketing background, I was pretty confident. I've been doing that for 25 years. I'd worked internationally. I was pretty, pretty confident in, in what I did. But in photography, I, I had no self confidence in anything I did. I, I, I didn't like anything I, I, I did. And um, I always felt like I'm being judged, right? So you want to give your best photo out there. And um, I told them, I said, you've seen my work. I'm not trying to BS you. If you want to hire me, it's on you. So they did, and because I was so, I lacked so much confidence, I think I, I kept my head down, and I just worked hard, and I just worked constantly. And I, what was unique for me was that when I was working and when I was off, I was doing the exact same thing. So working just gave me better access to take the photos I wanted to take. If I was off, then I had to figure out a way to get behind the scenes somewhere to get the photos I wanted. So working was always better for me, and so I just racked up overtime, and it was fine. So, um, so I got started doing, you know, just daily news stuff, just daily assignments, everything that they they asked me to do, I went out and did. And in very short order, I started doing um, work for USA Today, and that just began to, again, I just when people ask me how I got started. It's like, I have no idea. I, I just, um, lucky and, you know, it, it, I think it goes back to the whole thing about the harder you work, the luckier you get. Because I know I was working hard, but I really wasn't, it wasn't like I had a goal. Like it was something I wanted to do all my life. I never thought I was qualified to be a photographer. I just never thought I'd be at that level. This photo is interesting to me because it was one of my very first um, assignments that I, it wasn't a, an assignment, this was actually just for fun. I went to Natchitoches, just the Battle of Natchitoches, a reenactment, Civil War reenactment, and, and I'm embedded with these guys, almost like a war correspondent is the way I felt about it. And I'm trying to shoot from a perspective, right? And I'm shooting from a perspective of the soldier. And I got this shot, and I just love this shot, you know, because I'm showing death, and that's what the Civil War was all about. 
This shot shows the ring and it's just the family. And it, that's what it said to me when I, when I got this shot. And then after this was all done, someone who was there sent me this photo and I was forever grateful. Because it showed the other side of the lens. And I think this is what really speaks to me when I talk about how I got the shot. You see it from, you see a photo, you see it from the photographer's perspective. But this is really neat because it lets you see what, what, what the setting was and what was going on. That's kind of what my, how I got the idea or the concept for how I got the shot. Um, so very shortly after starting the, um, <clears throat> about six months into, it was actually um, in July of 2016, this was, I was asked by USA Today to do the daily photos for a documentary that they were going to be putting together on the longest cold case in history that was prosecuted in the U.S. and we got a conviction. And so we had a whole team of us there. We set up, rented a house. We had a studio set up to do interviews, and I was doing all the daily photos. It was my primary responsibility. So this is my first, what they call a perp walk. I'd never done a perp walk. I'd only heard about it in movies, and I had to position myself across the street, and I had to learn really, really quick how a perp walk works. So, meaning they're gonna bring this, this um, the person who's on trial for trial from the, from the jail, and they're gonna escort him. It's gonna take about five seconds to go from the van into the door of the courthouse, and that's it. So I had to learn how to position myself because different vans use different doors. Um, I had to look at the van, read the number on the van coming down the road and figure out which door they were gonna use and then move. So it took me four days of basically hunting this guy. It was like big game hunting. In the morning, I would be out there before they got there. In the afternoons, at the end of the court, I would be there uh, in the sun just waiting. And then I got better over every day. I, got, I just started tightening up my schedule where I knew when they were gonna be there. Um, but of course, they don't wanna share any information with you because that's part of the, the job of, the, of law enforcement when they deliver. They don't want somebody to try to break him out. Kind of thing. So you can see this is my first day. I'm kind of just gonna go through a couple photos. I'm just barely getting a, a glimpse of the guy. Just barely getting a, you know, kind of a shot. You know, just that's, that's the, the opening I had at that location. When he walked past that door, that's it. That's what, three steps, two steps? And if you miss it, <laughs> you miss it. There's no doing it over again, you know. Um, again, from behind, not a good shot. The other side one. I get a little bit better now. I've got my position a little bit better. I'm, I'm zoning in on him. And then, yeah, a little bit better. Got a little eye contact. He sees me over there. He knows what I'm doing. Boom. That's my shot. This is the shot that ran on the front page of USA Today with the headline, Kill Him. He was convicted of killing his wife in 1962 in Lake Charles. And this was a cold case that was started by a reporter for USA Today who, on the by the request of another um, victim of his, uh, she went to him and asked him to investigate. He opened an investigation and did a, a story on it in USA Today, turned his information over to the DA. The DA picked up the case and prosecuted it. And all these years later, he's convicted and now he's in jail. So I was very proud to work with uh, Jerry Mitchell was the reporter that, that did that uh, assignment. And um, of course we talked about who's gonna play us in the movie. So I don't know who I'm gonna get, but <laughs> just wait for that blockbuster to come out. All right, so now I'm gonna go to sports. So I'll give you a little bit of trivia. So I shoot also, I, I really gravitated towards sports. Uh, I just like the action of it. Um, I was just out yesterday on a swamp tour and I do, some, I do a lot of kayaking and I do a lot of outdoor stuff, but I don't do a lot of landscape photography or a lot of sunset photography, mainly because I'll go out and shoot something and I like it, and it's great, I love it. But then I shot that, so I wanna shoot something else. And I have a good friend of mine, he can shoot sunsets every day. And that's, he shoots great stuff every day, but I just need a little more motivation from time to time. So sports or action stuff really kind of captures me and keeps my attention, so to speak. So, um, so I really started doing a lot more sports and I quickly became uh, kind of one of the primary sports photographers. And so that was 2016. So by 2017, I was shooting the, shooting the Saints. I'd been shooting high school and then some college. 
And then in 17, I got the call to do, uh, do the Saints, which is again, very, at that time I was 52 years old. And you know, there's guys in there that have been shooting for you know, Chuck Cook, AJ Cisco, Gerald Herbert. I mean, those guys have been shooting for 30, 40 years, right? And we're about the same age. You know, I'm a little younger than some of those guys, but I was the rookie in the room. And um, so it was, kind of, it was kind of tricky, but those guys certainly know what they're doing. And I just tried to, I just tried to keep up with them. That's all I was trying to do. Um, call it championship there. So this is my first shot of Drew Brees. I, over the years, I've shot thousands of photos of Drew Brees. And um, this is probably one of the, my favorite ones because I don't get, I didn't get very many of the run out tunnel because there's always a lot of people there. And I shot it a couple times and then I just moved on. I said, you know what, I'm not even gonna fight that because I shoot all the pregame and I move those photos and I gotta come out and shoot the first half and I gotta move at halftime and then I shoot the second half. So there's a lot going on for me. I'm, I'm really busy and this, this pregame stuff, it's, it's very time consuming and it takes me away from, I missed the first part of the game. So I just started focusing on the game photos. But, so I've got my, my Drew Brees photo, I can put that in the, in, the, in the bag. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of trivia. So in 2017, there was a game between the Detroit Tigers and the New Orleans Saints. And you, you're probably familiar with how the Saints kind of started this thing where the defense would uh, celebrate whenever they make a big play. They come over, they mug for the cameras and the photographers to get their photos. A lot of other teams started doing it too. And um, I went back and realized that there was, when this began, and it began with Marshawn Lattimore. And I didn't really set it up very well because I was gonna, you know, maybe should, should have given a little more suspense and asked you who you think the photographer was that shot that, but it was me. So he ran to the corner and actually I was switching sides because I thought I was out of range where I was in that end zone. I'm switching sides, he does a pick six, he runs to the corner and he runs right up to me and I just took his picture. It was just that simple. And then he turns and there's a group of photographers on the ground and he turns, the rest of the defense, you see them coming up behind him and they all run to those guys and they all gonna pose for a picture. But all those guys had their big lenses. They got 300s and 400 millimeter lenses. So they couldn't get the photo. So I ran around behind them and I got that photo. So I got the, the first shot of all those guys posing. I got a couple more in here. So, so this is the shot from Chuck Cook, who was across the field, and he shot it. And so you, you can see me with the gray hat. I'm getting the shot. AJ Cisco's right there smiling. AJ just looking at him because he's got a 400 millimeter in his hand. He can't take a picture. Derek Dingle's sitting on the ground, and he's got a 200. And so here's Derek's photo. He didn't, he didn't have enough enough lens, enough wide, a wide enough lens. Um, and so, yeah, so that was my, my distinction, you know? So it was always kind of a, it's a little bit of a crapshoot whether you were gonna get those photos or not, because it just depended on where they were gonna run to. Um, sometimes they would jump in the stands and if you were right there, you got those shots. So I, I definitely got some good ones along the way, but it's just, um, you gotta pick, you know? It's kind of like when they're, when it's, um, when it's a scoring play, right? They're right, right at the end zone and they're ready to score and I'm in the end zone, but you kind of got to pick what side of the end zone you're going to be on. And it's, it's, it's like playing Texas Hold'em, you're all in. So you pick a side, they run it the other way, you don't have that shot, somebody else gets it. So it's always kind of like, I always just feel like it's, uh, it's gambling whenever we do that, because you're just picking a side. So at the end of that game, Stafford Barnett's the quarterback for Detroit. Uh, I run onto the field, and I'm going to get my, my, you know, my post-game photos, and all of a sudden I just feel, this, this crush of people into me, and I'm trying to navigate, trying to see, it's complete craziness out there. And it's a crush of people, so I turn around, and when I turn around, this is what I see. <laughs> These two guys are right behind me, I never even knew it. And I turn around, and I click that shot. When I get back in the room, I'm looking at my photo, and I see this guy with the white hair, he's from the Detroit uh, Daily News, I think it is. And I look around the room, and I see him, and I go, hey, this you? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, you probably have a picture of me. So you want to trade? He goes, yeah. So you got a picture of me. <laughs> My photo is better than his, but I got it. So, yeah. All right, so now we go to high school football. So this is a high school football uh, championship game in the Superdome. Uh, Acadian High School is playing for a state title. Um, I'm not showing you the, the game. There was an interesting thing that came about and it just, there's four photos in this package. The first one was taken at this, at this game. 
The last one was taken just last week at a high school graduation. So at the end of the game, everybody's celebrating, and some of the players run over to the first row of the fans, and they're high-fiving and stuff. And back before COVID, remember how they did that? That's what they used to do. And um, so I'm, I'm all, I ran up against the, the, the first row of stands, and I'm, I'm backing up and trying to get this, this photo of the fan and the player interacting. And I trip over some bags, and I fall straight on my back, but I'm holding my cameras up. So this kid turns, and he's just excited. Hey, man, and he reaches down, and he helps me up. But well, while he's helping me up, I'm firing my shot. So that's the shot I got of this kid. And it turns out I know the coach from, uh, from Acadiana. I found out the kid's name, so I was able to caption it properly. And I just thought it was just a great photo, just a great smile. It said everything about winning a championship, and that he's helping me up, and I just thought it was really neat. So fast forward to Mardi Gras. And I'm walking down the parade route, I see this kid. I think I see him. There he is. I see the same kid. I go, hey, you're that guy. He goes, yeah, you're that guy. So I said, hey, let me get a photo of you. But wait a minute, let me get down on the ground. <laughs> I want the same angle. So I get the same angle of the guy. The kid's name is Josiah Duplachin, by the way. And uh, just graduated this year. But So the next time I see him, they're doing a ring ceremony back at school. Got a picture of his ring. I said, let me get down at the right angle, right? So I'm out of Cadiana last week, graduation from the Cajun Dome, see this kid come across the stage, I said, I gotta get your photo. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. So I have to get down on the ground and get his photo again. So what's neat about these photos is that I shot this kid four times. I don't know the kid, I don't have a relationship with him. When I came across him, it just all went right back to that very first photo. And um, I'm just interested to see if I'm going to cross paths with the kid one day down the road. And, and so taking one photo of the guy introduced me to him four times. And, you know, who knows? He may do great things, and I may have a front row seat to it because I tripped over a, a double bag. <laughs> All right, so then I um, had a great opportunity to go to, say, I say it like that, and it, it sounds weird, but as a photojournalist, it was a great opportunity to capture some very dramatic images. Not about, you know, there was a very tragic event. Um, I cover a lot of tragedy. My goal is to always try to cover it with respect and honesty. I never, ever, ever participate in my shots. When you see a photo that I've taken, or any of my counterparts, the guys that I know that shoot photojournalism around here, one of the first things I was, I was told is you never participate in it. I don't tell somebody to look at me. I don't tell them to smile. I don't move something. I don't touch anything. Um, I shoot it as it is. And if somebody gets in my way, that, that's not an excuse. That's, that's just life. I just got to shoot around it. Um, if I were a portrait photographer or I did a different style, that's different. But in this world, you, you just can't, there's no excuses. You just have to get the shot. And it, it, it's experience that, that gives you the ability to get in position and take those shots. One thing I learned from this was that and especially here, is that for what I do, it, a very small part of it is photography. I mean, I, I can guarantee that there's people in this room that are better photographers than me, that you know the camera better, and you probably can compose a better shot than me. The difference is, is that what my job really is, is getting in position to take that photo. That's a lot of work. I mean, I fly in, I flew into this place, I got into a van, and I take off. I don't know anybody. And I'm watching other photographers from like San Francisco who are getting some cool shots. And I'm not really envious, I'm, I'm actually very proud of them. I'm thinking, okay, well, they, they're near here, so they have contact, they know people. I would expect them to get those shots. So I also expect myself to get them. But I've gotta now find the contacts, I gotta find what's going on, I gotta learn my way around, I gotta, I gotta learn how to work in a fire. That's the other thing, I've never been in a fire before. So. Um, it's a very fast moving environment. You gotta just figure it out. There is no rule book. There is no guidebook. There is no outline. You just have to figure it out as you go, what makes a shot and what doesn't. So this is the one of, I think I got two photos that my partner took of me. And I get, I take very good photos of my partners, by the way. I mean, magazine quality stuff. And they take very poor photos of me. I don't know why that happens. <laughs> Maybe I just don't have the looks that they have. Maybe they just better looking than me. But this is me. Um, I was able to get, I was in New Orleans shooting um, 
a state championship volleyball game, I got a call to go up, it was Paradise, California, and the, the campfire it was called, but Paradise is a, a, a beautiful little town up in the, in the mountains and um, was completely destroyed and devastated. It was kind of a retirement community, but a beautiful area, and the whole town was, was just level. Um, so I'm in New Orleans, they called me up, can you go, yep, and I packed up and left and um, caught a plane, went straight over there and was there for a week in the, in the smoke. So I'm gonna go through some of these photos and I'll just kind of scroll through them and um, I won't really talk about every single one of them, but I wanna give you a view of kind of what it's like. This is a complete neighborhood. This, this, was, a, <laughs> this was a huge neighborhood. There are probably 200 houses here. Everything is burned. Um, everything is gone. That's the, that silver is the is the rims of the vehicle. That's the aluminum wheels that melted and dripped down. Now aluminum melts at 2,000 degrees, um, and I saw this on the vehicles everywhere. Um, what's very interesting about and, and really surreal when I first saw it was that when you see a hurricane or you see a house burn, it, you know locally. You see all this, this um, burnt wood, you see all this debris left over. What happens here is there's no wood left. Anything made of wood is burned to an ash and the ash flies in the air, and then you breathe it. Anything metal will be left behind. So when you're looking at a structure, all you're seeing is the metal left behind. Um, you know, you would see um, a guardrail on the side of the highway and the posts are completely gone, but you see the guardrail and you see the screws laying in the dirt that fell out of the wood. The wood just disappears. So it, it's this very surreal, because you don't see any burnt wood anywhere. There's no wood. See, here there's a drill press, uh, there's, a, there's a table saw. So this was somebody's back shed, you know, little, little storage room. The shed's completely gone. There's no two by fours, nothing. This right here freaked me out. And I'm a grown man. I mean, I've been around the world a few times. And I look at these mailboxes, I'm thinking to myself, this, this was the very first, very first day. Within 10 or 15 minutes of getting to paradise, I saw this. And I saw these mailboxes and I thought, this is what I thought to myself. Why does somebody stack up these mailboxes that way? It just looked odd. Why would you do that? Well, there's a there was a two by six or something that they were on, and there was probably two rows of mailboxes. The wood is gone, the mailboxes fell. And when it, when it hit me, it really hit me pretty hard. Like, wow, you just, you just aren't getting it. You aren't understanding this whole fire. And it, was, it, it hit me pretty hard when I saw this. It was, um, um, everything was just completely disappeared inside of a vehicle. And again, we, we treated everything that we came across as hallowed ground. We didn't touch anything. So this is just me leaning over the camera taking a picture. Um, at that time, there were over 700 people missing, and to date, there's over over 300 that haven't been accounted for. Um, it was the deadliest fire in California, and a lot of the people are just, they haven't even accounted for them because they just completely incinerated, unless they're able to find, you know, a personal belonging or something, or they knew for a fact that that person was in their home, uh, the retirement community. I'm sure there were a lot of people that just weren't physically able to, to leave. Um, You'll see some of the some of these vehicles. Well, this right here is um, these are the uh, electrical meters, right? For these for all these homes, just completely melted, and there's no it's, it's dirt around it. So there's nothing. And you would think if I'm going to burn something, I gotta I gotta get the fire started underneath it. And but this fire just comes through, and it's just so hot it just melts and burns everything. So you, you drive down the road, and you see all these. Well, this is midday, by the way. You see that that sun up high. There's so much ash in the air, it's just orange. Everything's orange. If you're working on your white balance, you're like, no, it ain't white balance. It's just terrible. But you see cars everywhere. Um, and it makes you really, really think, you know, you, you get in your car and you got a certain amount of protection. So what was it that made you think that getting out of your car was gonna be better than being in it? What, what kind of inferno were you in? Were you in a traffic jam? Did your car break down? A lot of these cars were new models. It wasn't like they were old cars that you know broke down. I just think that either the tires would catch on fire or they would get stuck in traffic because everybody trying to leave. You got to get out of your car. You got to jump on with somebody else. Go on foot. I mean, I, I, I can only imagine what it would have been like to be in that inferno trying to escape that that spot. 
Um, yeah, when I got there, it was still stuff was still burning everywhere. There was still this is a the glass off of a of a I don't know, like a fifty something car, an older car, and the, they don't make glass like that anymore. But I just I thought about that when that glass just melted and curled that way. It wasn't that car. It was one right next to it. But. That's his um, cargo trailer attached to his truck. Another car, barbecue pits. Saw a lot of barbecue pits. I think they're, they all survived the fire pretty well. Saw a lot of propane tanks too that didn't explode. That was interesting to me as well. This is my partner. I was, I was with um, uh, Thomas Hawthorne from the Arizona Republic. Um, and Thomas is a really good photojournalist, but a really good videographer. And so I was really, using that, that opportunity to really learn more from a video from him, because I don't focus a lot on video. I mean, I shoot video, but it's, a, it's like my second language. When I go in somewhere, I don't want to miss the still photos, and then I'll pull out the camera and maybe get a few, a few videos, but I really focus more on still photos. And um, but we were teamed up together, so it's really nice when you have a partner and you can each focus on, on your own thing. Uh, that was really the first, you know, I, I went in, it was pitch black where we were, and I knew we we were probably going. I knew we were probably being a little bit um, reckless in a way. It was very dark. We had to go up some steps behind the house into like a an area that was right behind this home. We didn't know where we were. We know we we're going to the fire. There's firefighters in that area, but you know, I was still learning how to how to handle myself in a fire situation. Um, so we were very, very, you know, alert to every little thing going on, making sure we didn't get ourselves in trouble. For, for me, one of the, the um, my underlying rules is that I never want to put myself in a situation where I become, where I need assistance. I need to be completely self-contained. I don't even want to ask for water. Um, I want to have my own water, my own power, my own stuff, everything I need. And I certainly don't want to ask for a rescue person to come and help me. But one thing that's unique about California, it, here in Louisiana, for instance, if there's a flooded road and they put up a roadblock, you can't go down that road. Even as a member of the media, I can't go down that road. I can be arrested for doing that. I have to have permission. Whereas in California, they put a perimeter and they keep the public out. But when I get to that perimeter, I can show them my credentials. They will allow me to go in. However, I'm on my own. That's the stipulation. You have to agree to it. I'm cool with that. You know, I, I understand that. I wouldn't expect somebody to come for me because I chose to go past that perimeter to get these photos and share them with people. And hopefully what I'm doing is I'm sharing these photos so that other people don't try to come and be sightseers and get themselves in trouble. So, um, again, just an interesting photo of a journalist. You know, then of course we drive around and see this big 747 come over, this big tanker, but there's a, the fire was right over this ridge of this mountain ridge that we were on. We couldn't get over that mountain ridge. We talked about it. I'm like, dude, there's no way we're going to climb that thing and then have any strength at all to do anything. I said, we can't climb that, that ridge. So we yanked out our cameras and just started shooting whatever we could while, these, while this plane went over us. That was really my first time working with really, really, really low light. So it's like the brake lights off of the truck and I'm doing some shadow stuff with the silhouettes and Silhouettes really weren't my thing. They're still not my thing. I don't really do that a lot. I don't. I don't think about them. And Thomas was doing it. I said, "Okay, I'm gonna practice my silhouettes. We're gonna we're gonna have a little competition and see what we can do." And so, um, so we're driving out there that night, and we come across a school bus that's burnt on the side of the road. And um, there's a rescue crew there. They're trying to recover that bus and get it off of the road. But it also makes me think: this fire happened in the morning. Kids had already gone to school. Uh, parents were just going to work and having to leave work and get their kids and get packed up, get out of there at eight in the morning. And um, it makes me think, what happened to this bus? Who was on this bus? I bet it wasn't empty at eight in the morning. What happened to those kids? Where did they go? You know, it just, it, it, there's a whole story there. And I just, it's, um, it's chilling actually when I, when I look at those things. So Actually, I'll come back. I have a little video that we did. So that night, all these photos I, I have, we shot a video of them recovering that truck, and I can pull that video up and show that at the end if, if we have some time and anybody's interested in it. Just let me know. 
So to get into the fire, I had to basically figure it out. Um, I went with the PIO, the public information officer, on one day, and it was too much of a dog and pony show. He was kind of just showing me, he brought me to the, the point of origin of where the fire started. <clears throat> and it started on Camp Road, that's how they named their fires, after the, the location of where it started. It wasn't a campfire that started, it was Camp Road where it started, so it's called the campfire. And it just felt too, I just, I, I didn't feel like I was getting the real story I needed to get. And I, my motivation was I really wanted to get firefighters. I wanted to show, to tell the story of the firefighters. Those guys are some hardworking dudes. Those, those jumpers that get out there with their, with their rakes and the hose and they're pulling the, 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 uh, the grass and the leaves away. Those guys have got to be the hardest working guys that, you know, out there. And, and women, men and women doing it. Um, I wanted to tell that story. So I get out, I'm, we're at the command center, it's the, the, the county fairgrounds, and there's 5,000 fire trucks out there. I mean, it's just, it's just trucks from everywhere. And I get out there early in the morning and get there for the briefing <coughs> and find where the active fire is that day. And it's in a, in a section of the grid called QQ, they referring to it as Quebec, Quebec. So I get out there and I find out who's going to Quebec, Quebec, and it's the guys from Portland. So I gotta go find the Portland firefighters. Well, all these guys look alike. They all wear the same kind of shirt, the same kind of logo. You gotta just read Portland. So I just hunted these guys down and found them. And once I found them, then I had to get them to agree to let me tag along with them. So they tell us where they're going. So we meet them up on this mountaintop. Um, there's a chief up there, different guy. And he's the chief in command of that zone, the work that they're doing. And, you know, he's busy, right? He's working, actually, he's right there. The guy in the white paper, he's doing like a briefing there. And so I basically walk up and all these guys are there and I'm standing there and I'm thinking, okay, well, I gotta not, I, you know, I, I gotta talk my way in here. This guy could just simply tell me, get out of here. We don't wanna deal with you. So I gotta get his confidence and he's gotta be, he's gotta feel comfortable with me that I'm just not gonna be a problem for him. Because my goal was to get attached to an engine. If I'm attached to an engine and I'm with those guys, then I feel in pretty good shape, you know, because I have an exit plan. I have these guys protecting me. If I'm just on my own. Too many, too many things can happen. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I just knew I couldn't do that. So I just hung around, didn't make too much eye contact. You know, you kind of have to be a little, I kind of look at the ground, look up, and just wanted to know that I was there. And then over time, he, he, um, and things kind of calmed, there was a little break and he kind of talked to me so I was able to get in. So again, he, he understood, he, he felt confident in it, so he put me in and we ended up getting to hike down into this valley. Um, so we hiked down and, it, and what they do is they clear these roads with bulldozers. They'll clear these paths with bulldozers. And so that's what you're walking on, the, the, the loose soil that's left behind. And what they're trying to do is, is remove the fuel that's gonna burn these fires. And that's why you've heard the saying when they say you're gonna fight fire with fire. So they do a back burn. So they have this bulldozer trail, then they come back and they light fires along this trail <coughs> so that it's just a small fire. And then when the major fire comes along, there's no more fuel left in front of it and it stops it. So that's what they were planning to do. And so I, so I started my day at, I woke up at 5.30. I'm at the, at the command center at six. It took me till after lunchtime before I got onto the mountain with these guys. This right here, this is a guy from Portland. He's heating up burritos in foil on the engine block of their truck. <laughs> like, hey, fix it up. So he's fixing me a burrito right there. It was pretty good. Um, I met another guy. They carry these hoses in these bags. I met this other group. Because we had about an hour hanging out with these guys. And he had this bag and he goes, hey, sir, come over here. And he goes, look, I took the hose out. I filled it with more rations. If you get hungry, let me know. He's got a bag full of snacks in there. I'm like, all right, you're my buddy, man. Staying next to you. So we're down there. We got in there that afternoon. We had to hang around for about another hour or two. It was really like six or seven before we really kind of started working. I didn't really photograph anything till it was like seven or eight before we really got into the, to the, to the fire part of it. But here I was just kind of doing daily life, you know, guys taking breaks. Um, I'm just talking with guys. So then we, you know, night falls and now they're gonna do, do some back burning. So he's got a, um, a flare gun and he's shooting a flare to light these fires that are gonna back burn. And um, 
Yeah, so I, you know, again, you know, it's just, I know there's gonna be, it's pitch black out there, but I know there's gonna be light from that gun when he fires it, so I'm exposing for that flash so I can get some light in his face, that was my, that was my flash. So we're just, we're with these guys, we're walking along the fire lines and we're just, you know, um, staying out of their way, just getting shots and, um, but it is, uh, it is something to see, that's for sure. It was uh, very, this guy, I think I scared him. I kind of snuck up on him and the next shot of him was him, his eyes looking at me like, where did you come from? Um, That right there is probably one of my favorite photos from the from the night. Um, you know, just tending the fires as they're as they're going through. So it's probably eleven o'clock, and then we got to hike out of this valley. And I realized, wow, man, I wasn't ready for that at all. And I'm a fifty-two year old guy trying to hike out, and I got to points where I had to stop. And it was literally me taking one step, and I would tell myself, I say it out loud, I go step, step, because I was walking up this hill, and I just was completely out. I had nothing left. And at one point I sat down and go, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna stay here and die. I don't need to leave. Because it just, I was just exhausted. So finally I make it back to the van. And I'm by myself when I, when I separate it from my partner. And then he comes up about 15 minutes later. He's crawling on the ground. And he's 24 years old. I didn't feel so bad after that. <laughs> he was in as bad a shape as I was. So I'm like, okay, we're not gonna tell anybody. We, know, we both know what happened. I tried to pull up photos from the flood in Jackson, and I came up with Janet Jackson, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this is Janet Jackson. Miss Jackson, I think they call her. But. All right, so now we're gonna fast forward to, this is Hurricane Sally this last fall. Um, I started out the week thinking I was just going to New Orleans to get some photos. This storm was predicted to just be kind of a, a little storm out there that was gonna blow in, and we'd already been through Laura, and, maybe another one. And I thought, okay, well, I'm just gonna go stay in a hotel in New Orleans, I'm gonna get some, some prep shots of New Orleans and I'll be in and out. And I didn't really bring all my gear. I just kind of didn't think it was a big deal. Well, it just stayed out there and didn't come in. I spent the night there and then I realized the next day, I said, this thing's gonna come, it's building strength. So I took off and ended up in, in Gulf Shores, which is where it made landfall. So I got into Gulf Shores right the night before it made landfall, and I was in Gulf Shores and Orange Beach the rest of that week. So, yeah, so I was, and, and a big part of what I do too, I'm also one of the drone pilots for USA Today. So I do aerial photography and aerial videos. And that's one of the things that gets me into a lot of these places because they want to get aerial video of everything. So I go in first. I'm always one of the first guys in. And when there's a storm or something, um, I can't, I can't fly the drone because there's still too much weather. Uh, we follow all the same FAA rules as a, you know, a private pilot for a, a, a small plane. And um, so I'm shooting stills that whole time. I'm just capturing and telling stories. But there's reporters in, I'm coordinating with my reporters and finding out what their stories are. And I'm trying to build the visuals to tell those stories. So that, that, my job is essentially that. I'm a visual storyteller. And what I'm hoping that you get from my photos is you can see a photo and even though you don't read the caption, I'm hoping you get at least the gist of it and kind of understand what's behind that photo. And if you do, then I feel good. Then I feel like I've told the right story. And if you don't, then that means I gotta work a little harder. So that's, that's the way I kind of, kind of view it. So I'm in Pensacola and they want me to go to the, I'll go to Pensacola from there and then they want me to go to the Var Beach because they loved our video so much from Pensacola and Orange Beach, they were loving it. So they wanted us moving to Navarre. I'm like, okay, great. I'm kind of wanting to go home now, but I'll go get some more video for you. So we tried to take the coast road and it's through a state park and it follows the beach from Pensacola to Navarre. I've never been there. I don't, I don't know anything about it. So this is kind of a shot from the, from the deck, right? I laid down on the road and took this photo. And this is one of my drone photos. So it kind of shows you what the road looks like. And you can see where I am and way down there, there is a bunch of sand on the road. Well, I tried to drive that, and I got into that sand, and I started spinning. I got this little reporter with me, and she's really young, and she's kind of like, you think we should go down there? I go, well, there's no good stories back there. We gotta go this way. So I could tell she didn't like it. And I'm spinning in this, in this and I'm in a white Yukon Denali with my, my, my big SUV. And 
I don't know how to drive on sand. I don't know if I should be going slow and just trying to pull through it or if I should be trying to go fast with momentum. I didn't know. And so I got to a part where I was really spinning a lot and I said, man, I, I just can't keep going like this. I'm gonna get stuck and I'm gonna be in a bind. I can't put myself in that. I gotta turn around. So at some point I turned around and came all the way back. All right. And there was a truck down there that was stuck, you know. I made it past that truck and then I made it back and then but you just you look past that truck, do you see anything? No. I mean there's nothing out there, right? I don't know, there's nothing out there. Just a bunch of sand, box in the road, right? Alright, so at this point, <laughs> I just come from the fire station talking to those guys. <clears throat> you always stop at the fire station because they know what's going on and they always have food. So you check with those guys. <laughs> and so I'm um I'm parked in the road and I see this fire truck and I'm in a white Yukon Denali, right? I got my doors open, I got my drone kit out, I got my, I got a 400 millimeter lens that I'm, I'm using to shoot down there. And I see this fire truck and I saw it and I took a picture of it. And I thought, what's he doing? He's just looking at us. And then he just turns around and drives away. Okay, I didn't think nothing of it. I just thought maybe he's just riding around, checking for stuff. So that night, <clears throat> or later, I'm looking through some photos and I'm kind of zooming in on them. Now this is a photo I laid on the deck with a 400 millimeter and I shot down this beach. And that's that red truck and you saw from that aerial, that red truck was pretty far away. I was actually very impressed with that, that lens. And of course I zoomed in on that, that shot too, you know. But if you look way down there, you see that? There's some people down there. Two people that are in a truck that looks stuck and that's a white SUV. And I don't know this to be a fact, but I think they called for help. And that fire truck was looking for a white SUV. And they saw my truck perfectly fine on the road and said, these folks aren't stuck anymore and left. And these guys are still stuck out there. I don't know that to be a fact, but when I'm driving home, I looked at that and I go, that's why that fire truck was there. I think that's thought that was the funniest thing in the world. I couldn't. So, um, all right, so another big fun part I mean, really a fun part for me was being attached to the 256th Infantry at um, XCTC, the training that they do, and they are now on deployment in the Middle East. And it was the entire uh, brigade that was doing training at Camp Shelby in July, which is a little warm in July. I spent two weeks with them in the field, and as a, as a journalist, I did everything that they did. So I slept on the ground, I ate MRE, I didn't shower for at least a week at a time, and um, you just sweat everything in you out for the day, and then you just keep going the next day. I realized how bad I smelled. I smelled the guy next to me. I said, well, he can't smell me because he smells as bad as I do. So we just, just live with it. And I was never in the military, but man, I'll tell you what, I learned a lot, and I just enjoyed my old time there. And again, it was, I was just telling the story. I was telling the story of the National Guard. This is the 256 Army National Guard. The training that they do, the training is real, it's hard, it's, it's, you know, it's everything that you would go through in, in regular combat. So I was really impressed by these guys. So um, they have, Camp Shelby's incredible, it's huge. Um, they've got mock cities built. They have a mock um, Afghanistan town. They've got a big boss blaring music. They've got nationals that are there as actors that are participating. So they go to these cities, they have to learn how to communicate with the elders. They have to negotiate. They have to, so they, they're, they're doing drills that are real world. And this place is completely wired with cameras and sound. So they can go back and evaluate. And of course, the, their superiors, I'm sure, are watching all this in real time. But everything's documented. So they can pull up the section and say, this is what you could have done differently and say you could do it better. It's a very impressive place. Um, but I also, this was my, I also hitchhiked too, because I was, um, one night we stepped off at like two in the morning and we were going through this swampy area. And I had already hiked with them through everything. I went through every bit of bush they had. And, but this swamp didn't interest me because I had cameras. And I just didn't want to get my cameras with So I said, I'm gonna break off from you guys. So I hit the main road and I flagged down a truck coming by and I hitchhiked. So that, I hitchhiked in a Mardi Gras parade once, I thought that was fun. I hitchhiked at a plane crash, at a train derailment, and then in a, in a simulated war zone. So that, 
that's my, my hitchhiking uh, <coughs> resume there. Um, again, I was just shooting day in the life. You know, I was with the guys, so they're just taking a break. It's so hot, guys are dropping out because of heat exhaustion, so we're having to take breaks during the day. They're drying off their socks, um, just taking a little nap while it's hot, and they're gonna go back on some missions later in the day. Again, I'm gonna kind of move through some of these just because you know they're they just I want to give you a sense of what it's like. So as we're on these missions, they're 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 going through the woods and to initiate contact with the enemy, and it's what they call an op force. And the op force is supplied by um, a, a mountain division out of Fort Polk, and these guys are, are seasoned um, soldiers, or bat battle soldiers. So they are the opposition force, and they engage them. They all wear these miles gear, and it's like these this big laser tag game. But I don't wear a laser tag, so I'm invisible. I can do whatever I want. So I can run in and out and go in between them, and um, I, I get in some interesting situations there. But what they're doing is so they're going through the woods. And so what I was doing early on, and I learned I, I couldn't keep it up, but I would try to flank them. I would get a shot of these guys walking in towards me, and then I would take off and flank them and get ahead of them again so I could get more shots of them coming at me. And that was just killing me because I would work twice as hard as they were. And I had to slow it down a little bit. Um, now this is interesting because they happen to go through this little creek. But I'm a journalist, so I get to go up creek a little bit and find a log and then cross over. So I have to walk through the water. So lucky me. This group here, I actually stepped off of a truck. They were getting ready to go on an assignment. I hadn't I had not um, met any of these guys. This is uh, uh, Lieutenant John Lombardo, and I barely said hello to him. They said, okay, we're stepping off, and I just took off. He's going in the front of the back because it doesn't matter. So I got in the front, and he's walking through. You can kind of see there his, his rucksack, how big it is. I, at first, I didn't understand. I'm like, dude, what? Man, what kind of gear you're carrying? He was trying to make a point to his soldiers, so he's carrying all of his gear in his rucksack because his, you know, his soldiers are complaining about what they're carrying. So he carried everything he had to prove to them he could do it. So suck it up, you gotta do it too. So we're going up this hill, the sun's setting, um, and just a little bit further, we start hearing shots coming at you. And it, it says, it's as real as, you know, it, it feels real. And there's guys hiding behind trees and there's, there's officers yelling at him, get up, go, go, move, you know? And I'm down behind the trees too, going, man, you sure? That you sure we can go? You sure they're not going to shoot at me? But it, it feels like you're really getting shot at. So it, it's, it's really good training. I'm sure it gets their heart going. They don't want to, you know, it's, it's interesting. So then I went over to a, um, a mortar company. Um, those guys are a little different. I don't know if any mortar men here, but those guys are different. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's all the smoke that they inhale or something, but they just, they're a bunch of yahoos. They're, Good professional guys, but they are they are an interesting bunch. Um, I threw this photo in there because I liked it so much because I caught the round coming out in the smoke. And um, that took me quite a few shots to get. And, uh, but yeah, that was a, a fun group. Now here they are planning a mission. They're going to be going on at uh, when the sun goes down. Um, this is the Captain um, Cormier. And they set up this little sandboard, right? They got, they got it all laid out, and they got little tokens or pieces of cardboard, some little plastic army men. They're kind of, so they can all understand the battlefield and what their mission is going to be and, and lay out their plan. Yeah, so they, these, guys, these guys are sharp. They had the little, so they used use little sticks or whatever. But I was there photographing, because I saw this. And then, so instead of going with them to contact the enemy, I jumped on with somebody else and I went around and met with the enemy first. So now I photograph from the enemy side of things and get our troops coming into the enemy. And so when I get to the location, there's one of the guys from Fort Polk, and I'm looking around and I go, there's a road, there's a field, there's a tree line. I saw the plant. I'm like, they're gonna come in right there. I knew exactly where they were coming in. So I knew how to position myself to get the photos of them creeping through the woods. I got the op fighters, you know, these guys are firing at them and I'm right in the middle of the whole battle. So um, again, it's super dark, so I just use the gun flash, you know, the, the um, muzzle flash to light up his face and get a shot of that. And that was about one of my favorite shots of the whole trip. 
Then the next day we stepped off, Black Hawk picked us up, fly to another location. That's a reporter I had with me. He decided to get a little video. He was like, man, that was, that was about a bad idea. He was on that dirt road with all the sand blowing on him. So this is going into, um, a, a, it's called FTX. It's the, the final war game. It's a 48 hour, very intense uh, push off. And it's, you know, what I'm trying to do here is just walk in and around all these guys and just get, you know, show you behind the scenes, go inside and show you what they're, what they're looking at. That was the, well, Colonel. I like this photo a lot. That's um, uh, Master Sergeant Jonathan Desertel. And what's interesting about this is that behind that Humvee, about 20 yards, I was sleeping exactly the same way. I woke up, I stretched around, I walked around, I saw him, I go, I'm getting that photo. So here I'm with the commander of the battalion with his three radio guys and we're leading this whole mission and you know I'm just tagging along getting all the photos of them. So this is when I hitchhiked around and I got into the mosque and I'm upstairs in the mosque and these big speakers are blaring music and uh, I got video of all that. I should have put that in here. Um, next time. And, um, but that's the sun coming up, and they're getting ready to assault. They're going to be two battalions coming from two different directions. And um, they assault this town, and there's op forces in this town that they're having to... Now, from up here, that is the building on the left. All right, the white. And I'm watching the whole thing. And I see this. This is an op force guy on the right side. And I see our troops coming up this way. And... Um, I'm like, oh, this ain't gonna be good. <laughs> and he turned that corner, and that guy even had his weapon down, just blasting him. He's down on the ground. He's a, he's a casualty. I thought that was interesting. And this is where I'm walking through the city. They're firing, and I'm invisible. They're just shooting right over me. And they are loud. Machine guns are loud at that point. I mean, really loud. This is the commander and his uh, radio guy, or his, and he, they, they, they've got a position on top of this building, and this is an exercise, but he's sitting there with that weapon, and he's trained on that door, and when I came, because I, I knew where he was going to be, so I come through the door, and he's got that weapon trained right on me when I walk in, I go, whoa, whoa, and it's a pretty scary sight, you know, just, even though you know it's a, it's an exercise, but and he's guarding it. So what the commander, that's Commer commander, uh, Lieutenant Commander Scott Desertel, uh, no, Scott Desarmo, Desimo is the way he pronounces it. But he's now the commander of the 256 Battalion. He was a, um, a company commander before that. But, so he's up there and he's coordinating all of his different companies and creating his, his master plan, his battle plan. But that's where he's working from on top of this building. So this is, they, you know, were successful, conquered the mission, high five, lights a cigar, and I got that shot. I was real happy to get that shot. Yeah, last one, all right. And it is 725, so I will add, I will add Anybody have questions they want to? What do you travel with equipment wise, lenses and cameras and so forth? It changes. And it's one of my big frustrations because I like having a bag with, I like carrying every little thing that I think I'm going to need. And I like putting it in a certain place so I don't forget it and I know where it's at. But I change my bags according to my assignment. Sometimes I have a, a bag on wheels, sometimes I have a backpack, and I have to repack bags and I have to move stuff around. And it, it's very frustrating. I carry two, I have two D4S camera bodies. I carry 24 to 70, 2.8, and then a 70 to 200, 2.8, and I have a 300, 2.8. Um, but I've got a couple other lenses I'll bring in. Then I also carry video equipment. 
Um, that's my, my primary gear, and I strap that on, with, with, and I carry that everywhere I go, just about. And, um, and I just I pack it accordingly. It depends on what the assignment is, what I'm gonna, how I'm going to pack it, or I'm going to carry it at. Do you have to get releases, permission to take pictures of everyone? No. No, I mean, if I were to come in here into a private room, I have to get your permission. I can't just barge into your private place. But if I'm in a public setting, no, I, I can shoot it. Um, now, with that said, I'm not a jerk about it. I mean, I, I try to be very respectful. Um, there's times when, especially if it's, a, if it's a disaster situation, I know the best photo is going to be me sticking a camera in that guy's grill. That's going to be the best photo to really make it dramatic. But that's just insensitive. And it's just, I can't do that. So generally, I always want to shoot my photos without the person even knowing I'm shooting their photo. So I'll be far away. I'll shoot with a very long lens. But I really want to get in tight. So like if somebody's cleaning up at their house, I go in and talk to them. And I'll ask, you know, I just try to establish a little bit of a relationship. And I'll let them know, hey, I'd, I'd like to photograph here. Are you okay with that? You know, and, and sometimes they'll say no. And then we'll keep talking and then they'll usually say yes. I don't think I've ever had anybody just really, really no. And there's times when people say no and it may be a personal reason or something. But usually talking to them, they'll, they'll allow me. Once they understand what I'm trying to do and what I'm all about. And when it's a disaster, they're, a lot of times they want to tell their story. They, they want to tell somebody what's going on. They want people to know. And it, it is good because they need help. And people need to see my photos. If they see them in Virginia and Oregon, hopefully they're sending money and helping if it's a, if it's a hurricane or something. And so they want to tell those stories, and I, I want to tell that story because, like, Laura is a perfect example. Laura was one of those situations with everything going on, the, the nation's eye was on it, and then they left. And there was still, this town was messed up bad, and everybody moved on to the next crisis. You know, they didn't, nobody dwelled on it, like Katrina. Katrina, we spent months dealing with Katrina, you know. Um, so I want to keep telling that story. I was just in Lake Charles last week telling a story of the Magnese baseball team, their clubhouse got flooded, all their uniforms were flooded, um, houses that flooded. So um, again, I wanted to put that story out there so people know, hey, they, need, they still need help out there. Anyone else? Uh, you're shooting, well, anything, but like the game. Uh, how do you handle the cards? Multiple ones. I mean, I have, I have, I have double, I have double card readers in both my cameras. Um, I carry a now. I use QXD <laughs> cards for my Nikon's, which it's a little double-edged sword because <coughs> QXD card I think is a little faster, but it's very odd. And you got to have a QXD reader. If I've got an SD card or a CF <laughs> card, I could probably ask any one of you to borrow your reader, and you could probably help me out. But a QXD card, nobody has one, so I got to be really careful that I keep it. Um, my second slot is going to be a CF card or an SD. Um, my, my cards always go in my pocket, my left pocket. They're either in my left pocket or they're in my camera, period. I never set them down anywhere else um, because I don't want to forget them or lose them or anything like that. So they, they come into my pocket. I have my reader in my other pocket. I put them into my, my computer um, and then I put them back in my camera and I reformat. But I reformat when I start my next assignment. I'll leave them on there just in case while I'm moving photos, if I have a problem, I've still got them on that old card. I don't delete them off that card. My, my workflow is something that's, I think, very unique. And I think that's probably one of the most important parts of the job that I do. I think it's probably the most important part for any photographer. And I don't care if you just shoot your kids at the house and you're not a, you, you know, you just, you get to the point where you have so many photos, you're never gonna find the good ones. So you just buried yourself in photos. And the workflow is so critical. And I teach my workflow to my freelancers when they come in. I've got it all documented. But I've got a, a very systematic, I do the exact same thing. If I take 10 photos or I take 1,000, I do the exact same process. Because every time I don't do it, I mess it up. I forget what I did. I, they're all named the same way. But I can also pull up on my phone, I can pull up, um, 2017, August, my assignment, and I can show you those photos in about 30 seconds, I can find those photos. So almost any assignment. Everything's keyworded, everything's labeled, and I keep them all in the cloud, and we're good to go.